morning and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and to open this World Migration Report seminar, uh, webinar, I should say. Uh, my name is uh, Eva ackermann boye and I'm the director of IOM's new department uh, of policy and research and the Migration Research and Publications Division, which is responsible for the production of the World Migration Report and the organization of this webinar series, is an important part of, of this new department. Uh, and as you know, the World Migration uh, Report is IOM's flag flagship publication and a reference report uh, on migration globally. And it's IOM's main contribution to strengthen the global evidence base on migration and migrants, uh, to support states in policy formulation and uh, review processes, and combat disinformation uh, on migration and, and migrant. The World Migration Report is published every two years, and uh, the latest edition, the World Migration Report, 2022 was launched on the 1st of December last year by our Director General at the 112th IOM Council. Uh, we organized the first virtual uh, event uh, on the World Migration Report 2022 on the 2nd of December last year with our Deputy Director General for Operations, uh, Ms. Sugoshi Daniels. The first webinar provided an overview of the report and its digital tools. It was really widely attended, reflecting an ever-growing interest uh, for evidence-based um, information and analysis on migration and migrants by an increasingly diverse audience. We have the pleasure this year to organize a series of World Migration Report webinars to respond to the need and interests of, re of, of, of this report's uh, audience. We webinar, uh, the, uh, each webinar will focus on a specific chapter of the World Migration Report, starting with uh, <coughs> chapters of part one of the report, which provide key data and information on migration and migrants, before turning to the thematic chapters of part two, focusing on complex and emerging migration issues. Together with the different digital tools we have uh, also recently developed, such as the award-winning World Migration Report interactive webpage and the World Migration Educators Toolkit, these webinars uh, are an important part of our endeavor to constantly improve the knowledge on migration and migrants globally. It is central to communicate research and analysis beyond the research community to the vast and diversified audience that now take an interest in migration issues. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see attendees online that come from different paths uh, of, of, of professional life, but also geographical locations ranging from government officials, practitioners, private sector actors, and researchers, of course. At our last webinar that was held on the 23rd of February, which provided a global overview of migration and migrants, today's webinar will focus on chapter three of the World Migration Report, which puts forward key regional dimensions of and developments in, in migration. The chapter covers six world regions identified by the United Nations. So that is Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, North, Northern America, and Oceania. For each of these regions, the analysis includes first an overview and a brief discussion of key population-related statistics, and second, succinct descriptions of key features and developments in migration in the specific region, based on a wide range of data, research, and, and analysis. Key features and recent developments are also presented in the sub-regional level to account for the diversity of migration patterns, trends, and issues within each of, of these six regions. 
as one of the core chapters of the World Migration Report. Chapter three is updated in each edition in light of new data released by a range of organizations and information shared by IOM staff in the, in the field. As for chapter two, for this 2022 edition, the chapter also explores the impacts of COVID-19 on mobility and migration in terms of international and internal travel controls and, and restrictions. This chapter is of course most useful to understand regional migration trends and patterns. It supports us in situating one country within broader regional dynamics, all the more as migration tends to be primarily interregional. But the chapter also highlights how we can use migration data to show trends, patterns and differences across regions through data visualizations. Indeed, comparing two figures on the same migration data aspects from two different regions already quickly highlights regional specificities and differences. Although, of course, national peculiarities remain, of course, as the saying goes, a picture can be worth a thousand words. Before passing the floor to our speakers today, please let me remind you that this webinar is uh, recorded. And in the interest of time, questions will be kept for the Q&A session after the presentation and the remarks by our discussions. But please feel free to ask your question at any time using the chat function and we will take note of it. Without further ado, I will now be very pleased to pass the floor to Mary McAuliffe, who is the editor of the World Migration Report Series and also the head of the Migration Research and Publications Divisions of, at IOM. Please, Mari, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thanks very much, Eva. Um, and thanks for those uh, welcome remarks. And uh, nice to be back. I've been traveling, so I'm uh, a, a little tired. <laughs> we'll see how we go with this webinar. Special thanks to both uh, Linda Ucho and Andrew Geddes who are joining us and will be kind of uh, offering some remarks as discussants after my short presentation. Eva mentioned the pictures, paint a thousand words. I'll show you a lot of pictures. You know, I'm a data person and, and I like the visualization. So let's get into the presentation. I will keep it short um, and then we can get into a uh, discussion. And I'm looking forward to the questions too. Thanks to everybody for joining. Now, let me just make sure I've got this <laughs> started okay on the wrong page sorry let's start at the beginning can you see that at the beginning is that is that okay now that's jet lag yes we can see you right there great thanks um so uh i don't need to do kind of like the intro eva sort of painted the picture of the of the chapter but I will give a little bit of an update on uh, the World Migration Report, like the you know, series sort of recap uh, uh, and apologies for those who have um, heard all this before. I'll be very quick, but it's just a reminder. You can see there that the World Migration Report series started in the year 2000. It initially was um, intended to be a one-off report, but it proved to be quite popular. So it became a biennial series. We do it every two years, as Eva mentioned. It's a highly collaborative um, process. And, you know, of course, we work with many, many IOM staff from around the world, but also external partners, uh, co-authoring, contributing uh, in, in different ways, and also peer review uh, as well, as well as co-editing. So uh, we find that to produce a high quality report that is accessible and robust and is um, making sure that it covers the whole world not just specific geographies um, it's it's uh, much better to be able to collaborate with partners from all over the world so we're delighted that we have the opportunity to do that we've always had limited core funding but we've found that um, uh, member state donors provide the main funding support and increasingly um, with thanks to the private sector, our, our private sector partners also supporting uh, the World Migration Report series, especially in terms of the digital tools that Eva mentioned. And I've just put in a few, there's a few kind of logos there in terms of recent awards 
um, that uh, we have won in collaboration with you know, experts, both internal and external experts. Since the year um, 2016, we have uh, turned what was a, a thematic report previously for, for most of the previous editions into a global reference report. So we do part one, which is uh, key data and information on migration and migrants. And then part two are thematic chapters and they change from report to report depending on uh, the kind of complex and emerging or highly salient uh, issues that uh, migration policymakers, practitioners, and also researchers uh, are dealing with. As I mentioned, it's highly collaborative. Um, we have had the you know, real privilege actually of developing over the last few years uh, with experts, internal and external, the web page as well as the World Migration Report interactive platform, the Educators Toolkit, the digital version we're launching at the end of this month. Um, so we'll be able to, to uh, show people and share the uh, registration for that event. We've also produced a fact checkers toolkit and we are working on currently with partners, the Geneva Science Policy Interface and the Graduate Institute to develop a policy officials toolkit, which will be out um, at the end of June. And uh, of course, now the World Migration Report too, we've increased the kind of linguistic reach, if you like. So we have increased the languages uh, substantially. Again, with enormous thanks to our donors and supporters who have enabled um, those translations to be produced, especially in uh, official languages of developing countries, which is particularly important. This is just to situate the chapter that we're going to talk about, regional trends, basically, that's a, the shortcut version. Uh, chapter three, this is the overall uh, table of contents. And as I mentioned, part one is the core of the report. And then part two, the thematic chapters change from report to report. We'll be looking at this one today, the regional dimensions and developments. It is a very large chapter. So all um, I'm intending to do today is just to give you a taste of the chapter. It's very rich in terms of uh, research and analysis and data. So if you have a particular interest in a, in a specific region, I would encourage you to, to dive into the chapter and look at that region or the sub-region that you're particularly interested in. So regional trends. Um, we do look at uh, global migration data sets so that we can actually then disaggregate by geographic region. So you'll see that there's kind of two elements uh, to the chapter. There's a data series and then we also do descriptive analysis uh, at the sub-regional level as Eva mentioned and it covers a range of different topics where you might not have global data sets and here um, of course we're thinking about uh, irregular migration, we're thinking about uh, smuggling and trafficking where there aren't those global comparative data sets uh, that you can do across the six world regions. You can do um, uh, comparative analysis uh, looking at global data sets on COVID-19 and the impacts on migration and mobility. These are of course new data sets that have emerged uh, in the last two years and emerged very quickly. So we draw on those data sets and we draw on the traditional data sets such as UNHCR's uh, uh, data on refugees and asylum seekers and IDMC's data on internally displaced. Just a reminder there, as Eva mentioned, those are the regions that we look at. We look at the United Nations regions and then we do break them down into sub-regions. And uh, a big thanks to all the people who contribute. It is the most collaborative chapter of the entire report. Um, many in our team, uh, Adrian, Jenna, uh, in particular, we work with external partners such as Gaia Bell, but we also work with our regional office staff and, and you know, enormous thanks uh, to them for their contributions uh, to this chapter as well. So the geographic starting point, why do we look at uh, regional trends? Why is this important? As we know, historically, uh, geography is one of the most significant, but not the only significant factor that shapes patterns of migration and displacement. Uh, and we can take that right back to obviously Ravenstein's laws of migration in the 1800s. Uh, and it is particularly important 
uh, in terms of both internal migration and also uh, cross-border or international migration. We know that most people who migrate internationally do so uh, in a close by kind of fashion to somewhere that is, you know, regionally, uh, geographically proximate. Not everybody, but there is a, a, a strong trend. And of course, for displacement, that is even stronger because if people are being displaced, such as we're seeing in Ukraine, they will be seeking safety first and foremost as quickly as they can, the most efficient means that they can. And we're seeing very large numbers, for example, in Poland, as well as in Hungary, Romania, Moldova and elsewhere. It's also important to, especially in a policy context, and, and many of you know I've worked uh, for a long time in, um, in policy, uh, because regional analysis helps us to challenge some of those uh, assumptions and those generalizations about migration. And we're able to see things through comparative analysis in particular, really quickly, as Eva mentioned. Um, the regional dimensions can be very important in discussions and debates around governance. And I'm sure this is something that Andrew will talk about. It's an area of his um, expertise, of course. And so we produce this chapter so that people can look at the global trends, but then turn to chapter three and look at those disaggregated differences and understand in more detail uh, what is actually happening uh, on the ground. It's particularly important, um, of course, for, for policy making, looking at the differences that occur, looking at governance, but also applying good practices um, and making sure that we're taking into account historical contexts while we're looking at uh, changes and also challenges as well as policy solutions too. So let's look at some of the comparative analysis. Here we're looking at 30 years worth of international migrant stock data and immediately this three part graph that you can see the left hand side is Europe. The right hand side is Latin America and the Caribbean and you can automatically see very quickly very substantial differences um, over time. This is the utility of trend analysis. We do do snapshot. Uh, analysis which we'll show you in a moment but here you can see very quickly that we have very significant differences in terms of movements of people and long-term trends. Europe for example we've got migrants uh, to Europe that has increased tremendously over time from particular other regions and then migrants within Europe has also increased but from a higher base level and then migration from Europe you can see that's that's pretty much plateaued, it's fairly muted. On the other hand, when we look at Latin America and the Caribbean, very distinct and quite strong pattern of migration from Latin America and the Caribbean. And automatically you learn something very quickly by just looking at those two graphs, just by understanding this picture. We can also see the middle one here, migrants within Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, this quite significant escalation here, um, in the black, and that is of course uh, the movements from uh, Venezuela. And that's why we've seen such a significant um, upswing there. We look, and this is snapshot data, so this isn't trend data here. We sort of do snapshots looking at each region to also then kind of disaggregate by country so that you can see the top 10 or the top 20, depending on which series of, uh, of graph it is. Here we're looking at the top 20 um, African migrant countries and we're looking at both immigrants, that's the blue uh, colour, as well as emigrants, so those people who have uh, left uh, their country and gone to another country here. And we can see on the left hand side it's millions and then on the right hand side is percentage of the population. And you can see there very quickly some key issues, the very large uh, countries being Egypt and Morocco in terms of emigration uh, stand out quite significantly. Um, but you, when you look at that proportionately, of course, we can see that that actually changes in terms of South Sudan. So automatically uh, we can see something new. We're learning all the time and you can see actually the changes 
occur from report to report as we update the data. So I know that some people when they're teaching or when they're studying, they will use uh, chapter three and look at the differences over time because we do repeat these series, especially these key series. This is a new series, of course. Uh, we hadn't anticipated this one when we had uh, WMR 2022 in development. This is entirely new data, of course, and this is uh, COVID-19 data. Here we're using the Oxford Government Response Tracker. And uh, here we've pulled out uh, one of the key variables uh, that they use, which is the travel restrictions. At the top is the international travel controls. And at the bottom, are the internal movement controls. Uh, on the left-hand side is Europe, on the right-hand side is Asia. And again, you can immediately see some quite significant uh, differences. The total border closures, for example, the red, quite aptly, the red, um, stayed up, went up actually much higher in Asia and then also has stayed for a much longer sort of period, for example internal uh, controls, similar types of dynamics. And you can see the internal controls for Asia on the bottom right hand side, they have stayed up to a much higher degree, whether that's um, looking at um, complete closures or whether we're looking at the movements between specific regions and so forth. You can see that they have actually stayed quite high within an internal um, migration context within Asia compared to Europe. Here is another COVID uh, graph. This is drawing on uh, the displacement tracking matrix, IOMs, DTM, mobility restrictions data. And here it's quite a complicated graph. So I would encourage you to go and read um, the text around it. But I just, again, wanted to show you two different regions, Africa and Asia again, and you can see the patterns are quite different. Here we're looking at what is occurring both within the region on certain measures. We've got two, um, uh, ag disaggregated measures here, travel restrictions and health related measures. And we can see that they change over time. Uh, and Asia looks quite different again to Africa, has taken a very different approach. A lot of that is of course to do with rollout of um, the health related measures, the ability to be able to institute those in different contexts. And you can see for example, that we have the health related measures and the border controls uh, taking different directions uh, across those regions. Uh, Europe looks different again, um, as does uh, Northern America, Latin America and the Caribbean and so forth. We also use data to uh, show complex uh, issues uh, in particular regions. And here we're highlighting um, the refugee and asylum seeker data for the top 10 African countries. Uh, this is snapshot data as at the end of 2020, uh, the most uh, current data available uh, on um, refugees and asylum seekers. And here we can see, for example, that uh, within the region, we have some countries who are both the origins of refugees as well as very significant host countries of refugee um, populations. Uh, and of course the top ones there, South Sudan, as well as Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and to some extent, um, Ethiopia as well. And as you look across the report from region to region, you'll see very, very different patterns very quickly. And this pattern of having countries that are both origin and host countries of refugees is quite particular uh, to Africa, to the continent, compared to other regions. Internal displacement, of course, um, is affecting uh, the majority of countries around the world. We know this from the global chapter and for those who, who dialed in to the, to the global webinar, the disaster displacement is affecting the vast majority of countries around the world. So when we go then to the regional chapter and we disaggregate that data and we look at it on a regional level, we can see some very stark um, differences. On the left-hand side, we have Latin America and the uh, Caribbean here, and we're looking at both disaster and conflict internal displacement. And we can see the green is disaster and the dark 
it's actually quite a dark purple is conflict. And we can see that within uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, it is predominantly disaster displacement that is occurring internally within countries. But then if we look on the right hand side, we can see that for Africa, uh, we can see conflict uh, displacement, uh, new internal displacements for 2020 being both disaster displacement, but predominantly conflict and violence displacement occurring. So again, you can get that sense and you can look across uh, the different uh, regional outputs and see very, very different dynamics occurring. Asia, as you would imagine, uh, is dominated by uh, disaster displacement and the scale is, is much larger than for other regions, for example. But of course, again, just underscoring um, the increase in disaster displacement and every region being affected and the vast majority of countries around the world now being affected by disaster displacement, of course, linked to environmental change and climate change, as we know. International Remittances is a new data series for chapter three for this particular report. And we have put this in, including because of the changes that we saw in real time. Many of us were tracking the international remittances data uh, closely during COVID because it had such a big impact. But of course, we also know that it was projected uh, to have a greater impact than it did um, uh, for 2020, at least, um, at the end of the year. So here, what we have produced is we've produced um, regional level uh, international uh, remittance inflows and outflows to show the changes, especially between 2019 and 2020, and highlighting, again, linking it to um, the analysis linked to COVID-19 impacts. And again, underscoring that while many um, countries and regions were affected by COVID-19, um, it was vastly different to what was initially um, predicted. And we did see many countries and regions around the world holding up reasonably well, but not all, of course. Now, I haven't gone into, we've got quite a long um, descriptive analysis sections at the sub-regional level. Just on the right-hand side, there is an appendix um, that provides a bit of a cheat sheet in terms of which sub-regions are included and how we actually uh, put those together. We use the UN regions, but as we know, the UN regions are not designed for international migration at all. They're for, you know, very, very, very many issues. So while we use the six UN regions uh, for the data series, we take a different approach in the context of the sub-regional descriptive analysis because it is much more then linked to migration dynamics. So for example, we have Western Central Africa, for example, you know, North Africa, we look at Central Asia um, quite distinctly because there are particular dynamics, uh, migration dynamics around those sub-regions. We draw on a wide range of data, UN data, including IOM's data, but also country statistics, um, as well as uh, a range of other types of, oops, sorry, reporting, um, to academic research and analysis, which is much more likely to be at the re sub-regional level rather than at the global level. So we draw on a range of different studies and so forth. And we look at what's happened in the previous two years. Here are just some examples of some of the thematic sort of content or demographic. We look at gender as well, um, but it depends on the sub-region, of course. Uh, international students is a very clear one. I think everybody was affected by COVID-19. So we, every, every sub-region, we, we tried to cover COVID-19. But of course, international students is, for example, um, a key feature in some sub-regions, but not in others. For example, we look at irregular migration, smuggling and trafficking. It is a challenge and hats off to the team um, uh, for working on this and trying to keep it succinct. We know that we could write a whole report uh, just on one region uh, or just on one sub-region and many of our regional office colleagues do just that but it is really important to try and bring that together to use you know the data the research and the analysis to highlight some of the similarities the complexities but also the differences that occur in different regional settings 
probably don't need to talk about this really, but this is just a bit of a plug for the um, World Migration Report interactive um, platform. We are finding through um, formal feedback that we're seeking, but also informal feedback that it is being used increasingly as a tool for policymakers, but also for uh, educators and researchers. And uh, we are extending that um, uh, from report to report. So there are new outputs on the interactive platform for this edition, including of course, uh, COVID-19, which didn't exist for the previous edition. And finally, just a, a mention again, in terms of the languages, we are, many people are, especially in the publications uh, unit, beavering away on um, doing the layout for the translations, which are well underway, and many of them are, are near completion. So we do all six UN languages, we're also looking at chapters being produced in German, Portuguese, um, Bengali, and also Swahili as well, which I haven't got in there, sorry. Um, and then we're currently fundraising too for additional support, for, especially for uh, official languages for developing country contexts. Thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mari, for your rich presentation uh, of the key findings of, of, of this chapter. The chapter is really extensive with a lot of information. Uh, so, you know, it's almost in and of itself a, a, a little report or a big report with, you know, it's almost 60 pages. So really, uh, that was a, a, a quick and succinct uh, presentation of all that information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now pleased to uh, turn to our two discussants uh, that are with us today, and they are both um, long-standing partners uh, in migration research and members also of IOM's Migration Research and Publishing uh, High-Level Advisors. And first out, uh, I'm happy to, 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 to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Ocho. Uh, Linda is a renowned migration expert and the executive director of the African Migration and Development Policy Center based in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, if you want to look at Linda's full biography, it's also available uh, uh, on the web page of our uh, high level advisors uh, uh, network you can access it using the link that is going to be shared with you in the chat <laughs> so you can have a look so many thanks linda for 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 being here with us today and for for the collaboration we have with you and uh, we really appreciate your availability uh to be here with us today and share your views uh on the world migration report and this specific chapter so linda please the floor is yours Thank you so much, Eva and Marie. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, sometimes technology no problem. fails us. <laughs> yes, we hear uh, you and you see so you. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this webinar session. Um, I really enjoyed reading this chapter, but it is indeed very long, but very rich in terms of data and information. Um, if I do run over my time, please just let me know, because there's a lot to unpack. But I, I sort of, the way I approached uh, reading this chapter was to sort of look at it holistically in what's happening with migration and development in the different regions. Now, I focus a lot on migration in Africa, but it was very interesting as a researcher to see what was happening in the different regions uh, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 and how it affected mobility as well as development in the different regions. So there are certain common features that I actually um, observed from the different regions. And my, I actually enjoyed the different figures that actually showed us the trend of the different types of migration that takes place um, within, from, and to a region, which gives us sort of a visual of where migrants are going. But I had some observations that I saw that were common across the regions. Uh, first, um, obviously with the COVID-19, we saw a lot of reduced mobility across the globe. And that was quite obvious in terms of uh, internal and international migration. And we see that a lot in different areas in terms of irregular migration. We did see an altered flow of reduced migration patterns from, uh, for example, Africa, uh, Latin America, and also to a certain extent, Asia. 
Uh, we found, I mean, in the report, it was highlighting cases of stranded migrants, which was very common, especially those who were stranded in GCC, those loss of livelihood and jobs. And this is quite critical because it actually uh, raised questions as to whether there were return and reintegration programs that were actually working and uh, operational and how they actually supported these migrants in these situations. So these are not distressed migrants, but these are migrants who are economic migrants who unfortunately due to circumstances lost their livelihoods. So it raised a lot of questions about whether countries are uh, in a position to actually facilitate the return of their own uh, nationals. In particular, in, uh, for example, in our region, the, we saw a, reduce, a reduction of uh, irregular migration through the Eastern Corridor via Yemen. It was actually reduced by 73%, and this was because of the border restrictions in place. But this didn't mean that it wasn't taking place. It actually increased the cost of migration, the fees that smugglers were requesting for uh, migrants to seek pathways to these different regions. And this was not a, a unique to the region. We saw that, I saw that in the rest of the chapter to actually see that even in North America, North uh, Africa and also Latin America to some extent, there were issues re regarding irregular migration. Um, another interesting feature that I think was more common in Asia, Latin America and to a certain extent and, and Africa was the internal migration, the whole urban, rural migration, the reverse migration as they called it in our area. And this actually was very interesting because I think this is a phenomenon that I think many governments were not prepared for. And a lot of the smaller cities and towns did not have resources to absorb these returnees. And in particular in Kenya, it was actually interesting because there was a concern about these migrants because there was this perception, it altered uh, perceptions about migrants and health. So the idea that migrants were coming from cities or at risk of actually trans transmitting COVID-19. So there was an issue of awareness about um, whether the, the counties or the cities or the rural areas were prepared to absorb these migrants, these internal migrants. Um, the other aspect that I noticed also was the mass return or attempted return of many migrants in Latin America and um, Asia and Africa. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they, there was a lot of restrictions. So in most areas, it was you had to actually find your way financially to return to your country. And most of these migrants have already lost livelihoods and have no way of returning. So there was an aspect of how do we now get back to our country and be supported. And then when you get back to the country, you have to meet the COVID regulations of self-quarantining at your cost uh, over 10, 10 days. So those are some aspects that I saw that was a pattern in all countries, in all regions. Another key aspect that I thought that was interesting, and it was uh, reflected in the, one of the slides that Marie actually highlighted, was the disaster-induced displacement. And this was actually very interesting in the sense that across the globe, we are having cases, more cases of disaster-induced displacement. In Africa, we don't normally see hurricanes, and we were seeing them in the southern part of Africa. And we saw increased droughts, famines, and floods in Eastern Africa and Northern Africa and other parts of, of Africa. But this was not unique to the region because we saw droughts, um, floods in China, Germany, cyclones in Vanuatu, um, hurri hurri hurricanes in Caribbean and Latin America, wildfires in Greece, uh, France, Canada. And U.S. had a mix of everything, it seems, because it's like snowstorms, hurricanes, floods, everything that was coming. And it's the frequency, it has actually increased. And my, my first thought is that we need to pay more attention to this actual type of mobility because it's actually going to increase with time if we don't have resources in place to address them. And resources meaning let's understand the flows, let's understand whether our policies are in place to actually address these issues and whether we actually um, can reduce, you know, uh, some of the shocks, especially that uh, the low income countries experience as a result of climate change. And I think in the previous uh, webinars, it was mentioned about remittances. I won't go into detail into it, but I, it was uh, very interesting to see that remittances was increasing in most, area, most regions. And this was something that I think we thought would take the hardest hit, but actually it actually increased, but it also revealed something, especially in uh, low income countries. There's a lot of dependency on remittances for one, and also it's, it's actually created a safety net for those, for those households that actually have migrants outside of the country to support themselves during the time of the pandemic. But that means we need to pay attention on how we can actually facilitate these remittances and how we can actually support different, different groups and also create a social protection system 
for very vulnerable populations. Um, I'll try not to delve into Andrew's uh, corner, but I am a bit tempted to start that conversation on migration governance because that was an observation I noticed in different regions. The different response mechanisms and what it meant in terms of migration and how the restrictions actually made uh, a lot of migrants uh, reconsider or not move at all because they could not access different um, countries. But the interesting uh, country that actually brought my attention was actually Canada, which actually adopted a different plan that actually was to attract migrants within this space of 2021 and 2023. Uh, other countries were putting policies in place to sort of control mobility into the countries and others were exploring ways of actually facilitating um, or legal pathways to uh, residing and migrating to the country for employment purposes. So I thought this was interesting because it actually challenges our perceptions about migration governance. We have policies in place, we have frameworks in place, but they, were they sufficient during this pandemic to actually address some of the key concerns of the different migrant groups that were actually on the move? And in a, it actually strengthened our discussions about whether uh, about putting measures in place and putting strong policies in place to sort of support and protect these migrants on the move. So I think um, I've kind of like wrapped up some of my key comments on this chapter. I thought it was very useful. As a researcher, I felt like I got a snapshot of the global trends on migration aspects and how COVID actually impacted different aspects of it, but also the development itself. It's not everything. So I would encourage people to actually read the chapter and go to the specific sections, but also feel free to compare with the other sections because it actually changes your perception about the different types of migration that takes place. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end my intervention and I'll actually pass back to Eva. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, thank you for these uh, really interesting uh, comments and, and, and remarks. And I'm sorry that Everybody now has very little time to make. We could have had a longer discussion, but that's for another time. Uh, let me really quickly turn over to our second uh, discussant, uh, Andrew Geddes. Um, Andrew is uh, a professor of migration studies at the, and the director of the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. And his expertise is on migration and he has a vast experience uh, uh, that would take a long time to <laughs> summarize. So I'm also, again, referring you to the website where you can read more about, about also about uh, Andrew. Um, the link has been posted in the chat. So please, Andrew, I'm happy to hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Ava, and uh, thanks to Mary, it's always, uh, for those of us who work in this field, it's always a high that of the year when the World Migration Report arrives. And this time, the, well, I mean, I, I read the regional chapter again, <clears throat> and more comes out of it. So I think for all the participants, the opportunity to delve into this data is really valuable and the, and the narratives around it are really informative. Uh, so I look forward to the next edition because I think high, important issues have been highlighted around the pandemic. A lot of important information around climate and environment, which I think are really important developments to track. I think governance actors tend to put particularly climate as an issue to be dealt with in the future. And obviously it's a really important issue now. Uh, and so I think that's something that really came out to me from reading uh, this report. Well, I think what I was going to do is really just focus on one issue, which is really what this report tells us about regions. Uh, a lot of my research is on regions. I'm, my background is in political science. Uh, and obviously what this report focuses on is regions as geographical expressions. Uh, and a lot of my research is on regions as expressions of uh, government, politics, uh, but also we can think of regions socially and culturally as well. So I'm, I'm interested in what this tells us about regions. I think it tells us a huge amount. And, and the first thing that struck me is, well, Migration is strongly regional, and we kind of knew that, and this report shows that, that regions as geographical expressions are incredibly important. So we talk about international migration, but often what we're referring to is kind of regionalised migration. 
And so that kind of highlights the importance of the region. I think that has important implications, what we understand by the transnational and the global. Uh, because I think in, in many ways, the regional point of reference is so important. And this also made me think about some work we've done here at the European University Institute on well, human behavior more generally. So we've done work which has looked at refugees, on asylum seekers, migration, also on student mobility and remittances. But you can add to that also data on tourism, online friendships through social media and also international phone calls. And what you see through this kind of data is linked to a project we've got on called the Global Mobility Project. And some of my colleagues have been developing this. And what they show is that human behavior itself is also strongly regionalized. Uh, and so these, these data sets that have been developed by, not by me, I must have, but by some of my colleagues are incredibly useful in showing this kind of regionalization of human behavior. So as I say, for refugees, asylum seekers, but also student mobility, remittances, Facebook friendships, phone calls, tourism. So regional dimension seems really significant. And it is maybe it is, as we look at some of the data, we can see Having what came through from some of the data was the importance of kind of this intra-regional circulation. Although, of course, one of the issues is what, what we mean by a region, that this report is very focused on macro regions. And obviously what we have are a lot of the organization of regions is, is sub-regional. So in terms of what this means, well, I thought about of, of uh, three things that struck me, which may be just our points for further discussion, because it seems to me that regions themselves are very significant lo lo uh, as, locus, as a locus for action, uh, although they are very diverse. So when we scratch the surface of these regions, we see very different forms of, of regional flow, I mean, what we call re you know, sort of regional flows that occur, but also regional organization. Uh, and so that, that, you know, that seems to me to be an important point in the discussion of regionalism is their diversity. This, the second thing that came out to me from this, and, and as a point for discussion, is the way that regions, in a way, mediate between the national and the global. So we're obviously one of the things that IOM is very associated with is important developments around migration, mobility, then wide, more wider in the UN system around refugees. It seems to me that regions are absolutely fundamental to global norms and standards, and that variation at regional level is probably likely to be an important predictor of uh, adherence to global norms and standards and incorporation. So it seems to me a very important that mediation role. And a third thing as well, which uh, it seems to me is that regions themselves can be very active producers of norms and standards. So across all of the regions that you focus on are regional organizations producing very important norms and standards around migration which may apply to, or do apply typically to smaller groups of states, but can be hugely influential. And sometimes because of the proximity of the participants, there's kind of maybe greater chance of adherence to those norms and standards because of association through sub-regional organizations and proximity. So countries that are close to each other, working with each other, not always, of course, but obviously the proximity can be a driver of a sense of interdependence. So what, what this seems to me to mean, I suppose, just to wrap up this brief comment, is that when we talk about the global and the transnational and the international, it's their encounter with the regional that's actually really important. So we're thinking about responding to these huge challenges that this chapter shows out. I'm very interested in the extent to which global norms and standards may actually be regionalized. So as they take effect and have power and resonance, it's because of the way that they maybe are consistent with regional norms and standards. And I think that that's something that came out to me from this. I suppose it's a, an issue that occurs to me. It's more of a general question. It's not necessarily something I've got an answer to. But the more I read this kind of analysis, the more it seems to me that the re regions are going to be so crucial to any kind of uh, to the adaptation of global norms and standards. It seems to me they're more like global norms and standards are more likely to be regionalized than that regions are to be globalized. So I'll leave it there. Thanks once again for the opportunity to contribute to this. Thank you.
sorry, I forgot to unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for, for these really interesting remarks. And uh, there are also so many questions in there that we could <laughs> spend a lot of time discussing, uh, especially your last uh, question there. Um, uh, but I'm uh, mindful of time. And actually, we, we don't as of yet have a lot of questions in the chat. Maybe somebody will get going now, uh, putting more questions in, but um, I'll, I'll be happy to actually um, hand back over to Mari to see if you would like to raise a couple of que any questions to Linda and, and, uh, and Andrew from their presentation while we're also waiting for possible any question that might come uh, in, in the chat. Uh, but Thanks, Eva. I will. And um, I'll, I'll pick up on something that, that both uh, Linda and Andrew pointed to, but in quite different ways. And that is how important, of course, you know, the regional dynamics are, but how they are spread right the way through the report as well. So the global overview is really just the, the introduction, I suppose. It's the one that is used, um, you know, by the media most we get her, you know, media reach on that one. It's used to introduce the topic of international migration. But for those people who are kind of working in the space, the practitioners, the researchers, people who are studying um, international migration, the policymakers, they do tend to look at the regional chapter and we're, we're, you know, doing research on how people use the report so that we can extend its utility and, and design new tools and things as well as, you know, update the content. So any feedback on the content is also very useful for us as well. But what we find is that the, the regional chapter is very, very critical for people who are actually working in the space and need to have sort of like more detail, but it then threads right the way through the thematic chapters. So Andrew, when you were talking about, um, you know, it's not really about the globalization, it's more about, you know, re really we're talking about the regionalization of governance in terms of um, international migration. Uh, Linda and I um, had a great uh, time working on one of the thematic chapters for the current report, which we will do a webinar on a bit later. It's called, we call it the stepladder chapter, but it really looks at the um, global data in terms of how people are moving and, and challenges the whole idea of the mo mobility transitions or hump migration kind of theory. And we look at uh, ECOWAS, uh, free movement arrangements and Schengen to see if there is an impact in terms of those regional policy settings um, that people are able to access. And there is. We find it both in terms of low HDI countries in ECOWAS as well as in very high human development index HDI countries in uh, the Schengen arrangement. So it's an important, but it's also features in the chapter that Celine led on, on trafficking. The regional dimensions are so important. It's, it's in uh, the one that Adrian led on the HDPN or the, um, you know, the global peace development um, uh, uh, connections in terms of humanitarian peace development nexus chapter, for example. It is, so important right the way through the entire report uh, that it is, I guess, distilled. So when we produce it, we look back at the previous thematic areas and the thematic chapters and try and incorporate them into the regional um, chapter, which is a bit of a challenge and it does end up being quite long because it is such a strong and important factor in terms of both governance and migration patterns and processes. Um, it is the starting point. We would very much welcome feedback. Um, we're always trying to uh, improve the uh, contributions that we make as a team, as an organization. So we're, we're really looking forward to, uh, to feedback from a whole host of people. Feel free to contact us and, uh, and, and share your, your, how you use it, what you would like to see. We're, we're most interested. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mari. And I'd be happy to also turn to Linda and, and Andrew, if you would like, if you have any question or comment on e each other's uh, reflections, that would also be, of course, of, of interest or something that you might uh, have wanted to, to raise but didn't have time to do. You have, you know, two, two minutes each <laughs> before we, we go to the closing. Maybe, uh, Linda, would you like to go first? 
Uh, I was just actually trying to look at my notes to see if I've actually missed out on anything. Um, I think the interesting aspect that I, I don't know if I mentioned it, I think it was the gendered nature of migration. I was seeing aspects of it being raised in different countries and it's always within the regular migration patterns and the protection issues associated with their migration. I think that's something that I, going forward, I would like to see a little, a little bit more on it in terms of the different, um, maybe looking at it from the gut because now with COVID, it has revealed other aspects that we need to take into consideration regionally, nationally, how are countries actually addressing this gendered aspect of migration. And I think going for the next series would actually provide a different picture or an altered picture of what type of migration is taking place. So I think that's the only um, point that I felt that was pending from my extensive notes, <laughs> notes that I had, but it'll be great to see if that's something that we can elaborate on or maybe even have something. Uh, Thank you very much, Linda. Would you like to, to, to add something, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I would. Well, see, I, I'm, <laughs> I suppose it's something, I, I suppose it's beyond the scope of the report, but it's something that occurs to me as, re, as I read it, because I'm, and it may not be something that, that you'd want to necessarily include in the report, but as a, one, one of the things I'm very interested in, in terms of my research and background as a political scientist is, is the way that if we look across many of the world's major destination countries, globalization, regionalization, I mean, also maybe cosmopolitanism are contested in uh, domestic politics. And I, I, these trends are very different across the world, but obviously what we have seen, and we're very interested to see how these trends evolve in the future, is some kind of you know, increased contestation of globalization. And I think regionalism is part of that. So we've seen in Europe, we saw in North America in the major destination countries where immigration became a very highly salient issue connected also to uh, forms of governance beyond state regions, the global, these kind of things. Uh, and I think it does connect with some of the themes that you have been addressed in this work around well, kind of disinformation as well, and you know the kind of the, the general political climate in which migration is discussed, and the kind of destabilizing components of that. And I think that in certainly in in Europe, and I think in particular in the United States as well, the the that there there's evidence of kind of dividing lines in politics around the national and the international. Uh, and I, I, it's as it's. it's more difficult to, I suppose, to accommodate that. But I think there are some very interesting uh, aspects within the report that touch upon this. And uh, it's certainly something I think is, is quite relevant, but very interesting. So one of the effects of the pandemic has been to take some of the heat out of the migration issue because of obviously other concerns. Uh, and obviously that now, you know, with the situation in Ukraine and obviously displacement in other parts of the world as well, I think there's some really interesting political developments that could, you know, in terms of the salience of migration, it could also have regional ramifications as well. So kind of disconnected a bit there, sorry about that, but uh, there were things on my mind. I'm not sure they're all connected in any coherent way, but uh, yeah, the report makes you think, and those are some of the things that made me think. Thanks. I'm... Thank you very much, Andrew, for that. And I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> and we've taken note both of, of Linda's and Andrew's uh, suggestions also for, for, for upcoming reports, which of course is being planned by Mari and <laughs> her team already now. So uh, with that, I will just want to say thank you very much to, uh, to our participants, to Mari, Andrew and, and, and Linda for, for uh, uh, taking the time of uh, uh, joining us. We, we, Linda and Andrew, we really, really sincerely appreciate your participation uh, in this. And before uh, we close, I'd just like to say that if you haven't done it yet, let me invite you to, to uh, go through chapter three uh, uh, of, of the report. And also please have a look at the WMR interactive webpage because it's really really worth a, a, a visit and I just want to also put a very short plug for an upcoming event that we are doing when we are launching the World Migration Interactive Educators Toolkit 
which provides resources for educators that teach about migration, migrants, human geography, and so on. Uh, and it, it, of course, builds on the World Migration Reports series. It will take place on the 30th of March. And we have Michael Clemens and Alejandro Moreno uh, Savala, who will uh, be part of that as also as discussants. Uh, uh, and you will be able to see in the chat a flyer for, for, for uh, this, this event. And the next event in this series, uh, the World Migration Report webinar series will take place on, on the 12th of, of April. So uh, please join us. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to, to uh, seeing you all again at our next event. And thanks to everybody very much for participating today. Thank you and bye.